So uh, this is the fifth BioXL webinar, and uh, the presenter are Vera Matzwer for European from the European Bioinformatics Institute and Marta Llorendi Nares. So the presenter of today are Vera Matzer. Vera is a senior scientific project manager of the European Bioinformatics Institute MBL training team. She leads training and dissemination for several European funded projects. She got a PhD in plant developmental genetics, University of York. In New York, she started to be interested and involved in training and teaching. One of her peculiarities, she enjoys adding elements of the games, games thrown into her workshops. She also enrolls in the U Executive Master in Management of Research and Infrastructure. Marta Lore Dinares is a scientific project manager in ABI uh, MBL training team. In particular, she develops and organizes training activity for, for several European funded projects, among others, BioXL. She got her PhD in biomedicine from the Pompou Fabra University of Barcelona. And already in Barcelona, she got involved in teaching activity, and in particular in problem based learning. Then she moved for a postdoc in Denmark in molecular biology. But in Aros, Denmark, she also completed her teaching training program and then she joined AMBI. So now I'm welcome both Vera and Marta. Um, hi everyone, I'm Vera. Thank you very much, Alessandra, for the introduction. So um, today, Marta and I are going to take you through um, how we are using competencies to guide training and professional development. We're both based at the Envil EBI training team and um, we apply competencies in a number of EU projects and BioXL has been the one where we've done this for the, for the longest, so it's most developed. So before we actually dive into our competency activities, I actually want to highlight that we had a really big milestone for um, BioXL. BioXL actually has its fifth anniversary um, today or this week. Um, and there may well be some people among the audience who are a little bit less familiar with BioXL. So BioXL is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. And our mission has been to provide life science researchers with high quality user friendly software in order for them to be able to increase their expertise and skills and thereby strengthen the community. Now, our vision has been that extreme scale computing should be at the heart of life science research. And to celebrate our five year anniversary, um, there, there is a blog that you can read about um, what's happened in the last five years. And there's also a video on social media where you can have a little bit of a look at what's happened over the last five years. So I very much encourage you to have a look at those, um, of course, after the webinar. So to start um, our presentation, I'm going to start with what actually is a competency. And because the definition is a little bit abstract, I'm actually going to start with an example. So I've taken an example that comes out of the BioXL framework. And the competency there is install or deploy biomolecular simulation software on his or her computer or server. Now, in addition to the competency itself, um, there is a list of um, attributes. So in this particular case, or for the BioXL profile, we have knowledge, skills and attitudes that actually add to the detail of that competency. Now, I've only listed two here. There are actually, in most cases, more. So an example would then be of a skill would be select appropriately packaged code. So all of the competencies and their attributes, all of the knowledge, skills and attitudes together form the competency profile. Now, sometimes your payloads refer to the competency framework instead. Sometimes these are used a little bit interchangeable, but in, in our case, we refer to competency profile when we're actually talking about the competencies and these um, attributes. And when we're talking about the framework, we mean everything because we'll show you later that there is additional information um, that enriches the profile. These can be things like user profiles or mapping, mapping to existing learning resources. 
So the formal definition is actually that a competency is an observable ability of any professional and it integrates multiple components such as knowledge, skills and attitudes. And these attitudes can be both positive and negative. So some of the key aspects are, like we said, it is observable and that actually means that you can objectively validate whether someone has the competency or not. Now you can collect competency of, or evidence of possessing a competency in a competency portfolio and this can be very useful if you're trying to track this for your own personal development. Competencies are also kind of a shared currency because they're applicable to any type of learning and at all career stages. What can you use competencies for? So the, I'm showing four examples here and later throughout the presentation we'll actually show you which one of them apply to BioExcel. So the first one is course development. When you actually have a competency profile you have a really good overview of what an individual working in a particular context needs to know. So you know what knowledge they should have, what skills they should have and what kind of attitude. So if you're done trying to train someone on a particular topic it really helps you to determine what has to be included it also helps you to pitch it at the right level are you trying to teach too much in one go are you teaching things without having the right prerequisites or are you actually teaching things that are not that relevant to this particular user type so having um, a competency profile will also help you to learn to write the learning outcomes so quite often we don't actually present competencies to our audience. What we actually present are the learning outcomes and the competencies help you to define these. But learning outcomes are a much more friendly way to actually use this for the attendees that you might have in your course. Now, besides course development, it also helps for the overall strategic planning. Are you covering all of the priority areas that you've identified for, for instance, your training program or your project? And are you reaching all of your target audience? So, this can really help if, for instance, you have to report on this. Have you actually addressed all of the key areas that you said you were going to provide training on? Actually having a structure in place makes that much easier to show. And then we move more to the individual. So when we look at career development, competencies can be used um, to track your own continued professional development. And also they can be a tool that you might use in annual appraisal or assessments of staff. The other thing that can be useful is actually to hire staff. Now, when you have a position in, in mind that you're going to be recruiting for, there are two elements that you're going to look at. You're going to look at what competencies the individual has to have in order to do their, to do their job, but also you want to actually look at how that person will fit into the team. So what kind of competency do they have to have so that they actually have a a little bit of an overlap to other members of your team for kind of redundancy sake and also that actually the communication works well between the different kind of job types that you have within your team. So if we're now looking at the, um, the structure of the BioExcel competency profile, we actually have a higher level than the competency, we have a domain. So the domains group together a number of competencies that are related. Below that, you have the level of the competency, and I've shown you an example of that. And after that come what we call the attributes. And in the case of BioExcel, we have knowledge, we have skills, and we have attitudes. And these are actually shortened often um, to the word KSAs. At this kind of attribute level is really where the usability of your profile is. This is what comes back in the learning outcomes. This is where the detail is and where it becomes usable. So when you travel down from the domain into the, the KSAs, the level of detail increases. Now, why is there a picture of a tiger on here? It's actually because this can get very big and it's definitely a trap that we fell into um, in the first version. So I'm gonna show you um, what the first version of the BioExcel profile looked like. So we started with four main domains. We had the generic, competency domain, we had a scientific competency domain, we had a generic computing domain and a parallel computing domain. So if we then add the competencies to that, we had a total of 31 competencies. Then we start adding the attributes and you will see that this will grow very big. 
So we added, we've got 31 knowledge um, attached to all of these um, competencies, and you can see that it varies how many per competency. Then we have the skills, 93 in this case, and we have the attitudes. But it's it's become very big. We have well over 500 elements now in this uh, competency profile. So what I'd like to show you is that competency profiles actually evolve over time. So the the first version was created um, when BioExcel was just um, launched, and last year we launched the second version. Now, one of the things we wanted to address was really to go back to basics to make sure that what was in the profile is fundamental. Um, we did a number of things. We deprecated a few competencies and we dissolved a number of competencies. When we say dissolved, it means we haven't lost all of the content. Some of the content was moved to other competencies or um, some of the elements were retained at the level of the knowledge, skills and attitudes. Now, how did we decide what's fundamental and what's essential? We actually looked partially at the mapping there. So when we did the mapping to what training was available um, externally, it, it kind of showed that certain competencies were not that vital to, to BioExcel. They're important when you're looking at being an, a well-rounded researcher, but they're not fundamental to BioExcel, which is why we decided to leave those out. We also merged a number of competencies. Some resources that we looked at actually consistently hit the same two sets of um, competencies, which showed that they were really related. So we ended up merging a few of those. We also wanted to have more consistency in the number of KSAs for each competency. Um, and there were some duplicate KSAs in, in the profile. And there we've removed all the duplicate ones and only really retained it at the competency where we felt it was most critical. So when we're looking at the number of um, KSAs, in version one, there were between three to 16. Um, in version two, three to 14, which kind of, to some extent, looks like it's, it's not that different, but this is counting um, the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes together. Well, if we look at one individual element, so for instance, only looking at the knowledge or only looking at the skills, it varies between one and 10. And there we've become much more consistent in version two. Now it's zero to five. We'd like to get that to three to five. So where you have three to five knowledge, three to five skills, and three to five attitudes, that would be ideal. And you can see that actually in version two, we've got that for a lot of them, but not all of them yet. The biggest difference is actually the total number of elements where we had 511 in the first version, we're now down to 166. So we have a much more user-friendly um, profile. So there are still some plans that we have um, for a third version, and we plan for this to come out before the end of um, next year. When we created the second version, we also had to um, map all of the learning resources we had a kind of a second time. Um, this showed that there were some gaps at the level of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And a few discussion points, we have a few resources that um, have things like machine learning in them, and it wasn't very clear where that fitted. So um, there's a couple of points that we still want to resolve. There is also some elements of best practice that we want to address, and we'll actually get to that a little bit at the end of the webinar as well. We want to be able to use the competency profile as a minimum standard, um, and we want to make our competency profile machine readable. So these are some adjustments that we're going to have to make um, in version three. So there are ways to enrich the competency profile. And I said that earlier, this, we have um, user profiles. So when we created version one, we had only high level user profiles. And actually we had these three. We had an entry level user who comes from a biology background and probably hasn't used um, modeling software before. We had a specialist user who has a much more um, thorough computational background and really is, um, is stretching the boundaries of what they can do with a kind of local compute resource. They really need to start using HPC and maybe they are already using HPC to some degree. And then we have a system administrator and application expert where their domain really is the HPC environment. So we use these, 
for strategic planning and to help us kind of roughly define our target audience. And then we mapped each of these kind of user types to competencies. And we then looked for each competency. Is this applicable to this user profile? Do they need awareness of a competency? Do they need working knowledge? Or do they need specialist knowledge? Now you can see that these profiles were, were really quite high level. So the next step we did, and we actually introduced that last year, is to create career profiles. So these are much more detailed, and Marta will show them to you later. Um, they really give you an idea of what the background of this, uh, of this profile is, then also what their day-to-day -day activities are, and how it maps onto our competency profile. Longer term, and this is something for next year, we want to create learning pathways. So we want to show that a particular profile might have a, a learning challenge and how you could use the resources that we have available to actually overcome that challenge. So this is how we apply that in the BioExcel training program. And I've already hinted at this a little bit. So we created the initial competency profile with input from um, the community. That was both BioExcel partners, but also people outside of BioExcel that gave input into the profile. And we had a survey that went out to the wider profile to, to write their community to give, give us feedback. And we've used it in different training courses where we've asked people um, see if they spotted any gaps or if anything wasn't relevant. Then what we did next was to take these competencies and map them to all external training that we could find. So that was training from BioExcel, but also training from um, the partners um, and training from any external entity that we're aware of. And actually, this is a bit of an ongoing effort. So when we um, come across new training, we actually again map that to our competencies and add it to, to our database. That really allowed us to do a gap analysis. It allowed us to see where the major gaps are, because as many projects, um, we have limited resources and we wanted to make sure that our resources went into the areas of highest training need. So that feeds into our training program. And we've had face-to-face -face training from the beginning, but actually in 2019, we started remote training as well. And of course, right now, all of our training is remote due to the pandemic. So when we originally have that mapped data set that listed all of the training, we really wanted to make sure that we could um, make this data set open to the community because actually we found a lot of training that was highly relevant to people. And of course, we, we have a very active training program, um, but it runs you know, 10, 12 events per year. It doesn't run every day. So we wanted to make people aware of the training that we found, and a lot of it are online resources that are available at any point. So we created both the Knowledge Resource Centre, and that later became um, an additional entity of the Competency Hub to make some of this data visible. So, and the main reason for creating that in the first place was also that um, it's not that easy to display a competency profile and there is a real need for a sustainable home for some of these profiles. So competency profiles often kind of disappeared in project deliverables or they were downloadable only as a PDF or something. Um, often when you had one, it was unclear who the owner was or if the profile was still being maintained. And in general, you would have to search many websites to find different uh, competency profiles. So this is why we first created the BioExcel Knowledge Resource Center. This was as a proof of concept. And in order to make these learning resources that we map to the competencies accessible. Then in the kind of second step, we created the Emble EBI Competency Hub as a kind of neutral, sustainable home for the competency framework to make sure that if we had a framework that was developed through, for instance, an EU funded project, even if the project um, stopped, it would mean that there was a sustainable home for the competency profile and there would always be someone that you could contact if you wanted to um, know more about it. So right now it's actually the competency hub that feeds the data to the Knowledge Research Centre. So this is where I'm going to hand over to Marta and she's going to show you around the competency hub. I'll show you the competency hub, so we'll go on a short demo. But before that, I'll explain you briefly what it can be done. So as Vera said, the competency hub is the home for a series of competency frameworks that 
anyone who has created those frameworks can add to the to the hub. And then once they are in the hub, a user can explore the competency frameworks and find training resources that have been associated to this, these frameworks. And in when career profiles have been added to them, you can also explore those and you can build your own profile. So you once you have your own profile on the site and it's mapped to the competencies, you can compare your own profile to the career profiles that are there. And that can give you an idea of where you would need to develop if you would um, get one of the roles that, that those career profiles represent. And now we'll go to the website and I'll show you all this on the site. So this is the landing page of the competency hub, which is competency.ebi.ac.uk. And here you see the different um, frameworks that we have with a short description of the professionals they, they refer to. So the BioExcel one is for professionals in computational biomolecular research. It's, and it's the one that uh, we will focus on now. As Vera said, it's also the one that uh, has more features here because it's the one that we are uh, using as a use case to develop uh, this competency hub. So we go into the BioExcel framework and here you have a short description about it and three tabs career profiles, competencies, and training resources. The career profiles one is uh, the landing one because we think it's the one with uh, that will be more interesting for uh, users. But I will leave that for the, the end of the demo and I'll start with the competencies. So if we go to the competencies tab, we see here the list of all the competencies. And as Vera said, they are divided in three domains. So we have scientific competencies, computing competencies, and parallel computing competencies. And one of the features that we have added to the competency hub is uh, the versioning. So we can keep old versions of the framework on the site that are static, but they are still publicly available. So the first version that Vera told us about can still be viewed if you click on version one here on the by Excel. It tells you that it's archived, so there's a newer version, but you can still see it with all the competencies that it had there. And this um, versioning system comes together with uh, release notes. So if we go again to the end, when we publish version two, we had a set of release notes that explain the changes that uh, we made. So which competencies were deprecated, which ones were merged, and which KSAs uh, were merged with uh, each other. So if I now go back to version two, which is the present version of the profile, I'll show you what we have on there. So apart from the list of competencies, if you click on each of them, you will see all the attributes associated to it. So the list of knowledge, skills, uh, and attitudes that correspond to each competency. And you can also go here to the right and click on more details. And that uh, will show you again the list of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. But it also has a box uh, here that can show information about other competency frameworks if this competency was derived from another one. It's not the case of this specific one. And then there's a list of training resources that have been mapped to the competency. These training resources are usually um, short courses or uh, tutorials that are available online. If we click uh, on one of them, here the first one for example, we go to a page that has some more information of the training resource and it lists specifically which competencies and skills and attitudes this training can help uh, develop. And from this site we can also go onto the resource directly. So now if I go back to the first page of the BioExcel uh, framework, you can see there's also this training resources tab. And when we go there, we have the whole list of training resources that we have mapped to the, to the competencies. And again, you have the competencies they are mapped to listed there. And if you go to the um, training resource, we'll land on the same page that uh, we just visited a moment ago. And now again, I go back and I'll explain you about the 
the career profiles. That is the last addition that we have done to the to this framework. So these career profiles are um, examples uh, of um, a person that could be in a specific role within the field of the framework. In this case, computational biomolecular um, research. We have created these profiles with the input of um, several experts from BioXL and also looking at job ads uh, or specifications. When we look at job ads, sometimes they have very general uh, descriptions of some tasks. So we have made them a bit more specific when we added them to the, to the career profiles. Um, right now we have six of them is two research software engineer, uh, a junior one and a senior one, two computational chemists, also a junior one and a senior one, and a PhD student and a research associate. The um, avatars that you see here, so these uh, pictures that are representing them, have been created together with an illustrator, uh, and they are modular and allow us to show diverse um, uh, pictures here because we can have the face, the hair, and the clothes at different modules that we can um, have in different colors and we can combine in different ways. So if we now go to one of them, you just click on view profile and go in there and you see a description of uh, this person, well, this example uh, career profile, and it has the qualification and background. It would be the education, so the PhD, the postdoc, and what was the focus of those. And then in this case, because it's an industry one, you also have when um, they move to the pharmaceutical industry. And then below this, there is the activities of current role. So what this person does in, in general in this role, and some uh, list of specific activities that they would do in their um, working position. So um, this can already give you an idea of what this role is about and whether you would like to carry out this role to be in this position. But also below the description, we have the mapping to the competencies. So we have the whole list of competencies in the, in the BioXL profile, and they are associated to a level, which in this case has four options. It could be not applicable, awareness, working knowledge, or specialist knowledge. And once you see the levels here, you can have an idea of which competencies are the most important ones for this role. So if you wanted to become a senior computational chemist, you would need the maximum level, for example, in this uh, apply expertise in formal, in formal and natural sciences. And then when we go down, we can see that the ones about parallel computing are uh, probably not so important. So that can already give you an idea of where you would need to develop if you wanted to become a senior computational chemist. But the tool um, can help you even more with that because you can also create your own profile and compare it with this one. So if we go to the top of this page, you see here a button on the top right, create your profile. And then when you go there, you have this form to create it. And it will be saved on the on the browser, so it's not saved on the website or anything. So I'm going to create a, one very quickly. It's um, you just need the name and the job title to create it. So you can decide to write a bit more on it, but it's not necessary. So once you have a, a name and job title, you save it and map to competencies, and then you have here the list of competencies to map them you need to go again to the top right and click on map competencies. And you have uh, here the whole list with a drop down menu next to each one where you can select one of the four levels that we have. And I'm gonna just do it uh, quickly here so that you see what we can do once we have a, a profile. So you see, you can select in each of them the four options. 
and I've done it quite random. I'm not going to say anything about the parallel computing competencies. And then you can save the profile. And as I said, it's going to be saved in the browser, so not on the site. And here you see it appears um, it appears the rating of each one. We could have selected, sorry, I forgot to say that, we could also have selected each of the knowledge, skills, uh, and attitudes, but I just uh, didn't go for that. But you could go to that level to, to select. And once you have it here, you can print it if you want and save it as a PDF if you wanted to have it for future references. But once you have it there, we can go back, and I'm going to go from the beginning, we can go back to the career uh, profiles uh, page. And now this profile that I've created is here. And I can use it to compare to one of the uh, career profiles that we have uh, created on the BioXL competency framework. So if I click here, and then I choose the senior research software engineer, for example, and I click on this button, compare select profiles, I will see a table with the um, comparison of the of the levels in each competency. So um, I can see which ones this the research software engineer has at a higher level than than me. And this would be, for example, user driven service provision and support. So if I wanted to become a senior research software engineer, I would need to develop uh, this competency. And like this, I can go through each of them. And again, as I said before, we can um, just see it and have make our mental list of which competencies we would need to develop. But we would like that the tool help us doing that. So we are working uh, on relating this comparison to the learning pathways that we will create in the future. But for now, we have a temporary solution that shows you a summary, which the competencies that the research software engineer has at a higher level than you. And here it should say research software engineer. We will correct that soon. But the comparison is correct. So the research software engineer has a higher level in um, service provision and support. And then if I wanted to develop that competency, these are some examples of the learning resources that I could use. But this is a static list. And our plan is that this would become part of the learning pathway. So they really show you, depending on the level that we are at which you are uh, in the moment, which other um, resources would be interesting to you to develop further in that uh, path. And this is what the Competency Hub um, has for now. And I'll go back to the presentation and just skip a couple of slides because I've showed you that during the demo. And yeah, as I told you, we are uh, working on this and developing it. And one of these future developments is creating these learning pathways and incorporating them into the site and relating it to the career profiles comparisons. And this would be a curated set of learning resources aimed at resolving a specific challenge, which could be how to make a computer program that can run in a parallel computer. We also want to improve the page navigation and user experience. If you saw what while I was doing the demo, some of the pages are better than others at that. And sometimes you don't have the button to compare profiles, for example, after you created your own profiles or things like that, and, but we are working on it. And then we'll soon add new competency frameworks. So we have started working in a new center of excellence uh, about personalized medicine, which is called PERMED COE. And we will also develop a competency profile uh, in there and we'll add it to the competency hub uh, next year. And we also have now uh, an external uh, framework manager using the competency hub. So um, this is an initiative from Elixir, uh, the Elixir node in the Netherlands and the Dutch national program in open science. They have created this uh, competency framework for data stewards, which they 
they are now adding to the competency hub and it will be available in the next weeks uh, quite soon and we'll also get some feedback from them about how the experience was so um, we would really like to hear from you and get your feedback about what you would like to see in this um, competency hub and if you want to do to tell us during this webinar you can do it on the question box if you want to do that please write suggestion before your suggestion so that we know that it's not a question for the question and answer session and if you would like us to contact you you can add your email but that's not uh, necessary you can also send us an email to competency at uh, ebi.ac.uk and this is not the only way you can get involved in the competency mapper in the competency hub so if you want to add your competency uh, framework to the site give us feedback about the site or the frameworks within it suggest training resources or make suggestions on what to add to the tool please contact us we will be very happy to to hear about it because we are uh, developing the tool and now vera will tell you about best practice in the competency community so thank you very much so a number of elements about best practice we've kind of touched on already but we want to just pull them all together at the end of this um, webinar so one of the things that we really talked about and this is something that we've um, come across in in different frameworks is that it's really important that when profiles are updated that there is some type of release note um, so that it's actually very clear what happened from one version to the next um, and that old archived versions are actually available because especially if someone else might be using your profile as a starting point or they've used it for um for other purposes and it's really good to know why it suddenly changed um, and how that's evolved over time sometimes competency profiles are um, published and that's maybe the only record that's available so actually having it somewhere central with release notes is really valuable it's also important to have persistent identifiers and um, we haven't at the moment got those visible within the competency hub, but in the back end, there are persistent identifiers for both the competencies and all of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes. This is one element that we'd actually like to have a way to have that be more visible, but we really have to think about how to do that because we don't want it to be a distraction, but it would make um, for higher quality release notes if there was a persistent way to identify a particular competency. Now, it's also important to have clear ownership of the framework. We talked about that earlier. Um, so that if there are questions or it's unclear uh, or you have feedback that you actually are able to um, contact the owner of the framework. Um, ideally, all frameworks would be publicly accessible. And this would be in a format that people can use. The other element that we've really been talking um, about within the competency community, and this is for instance, um, quite important also in the context of um, our train and ISCB is how to make competency frameworks fair. And some of what's been talked about there besides the persistent identifiers is also to make it machine readable. Long term, we're hoping to be in a situation where you might be able to download a competency profile from the competency hub in a machine readable format. We also would like to move towards where a competency is actually the minimum standard. So um, Marta showed you earlier that the mapping can actually be done at the level of the KSAs, where you can actually binary, in a binary way tick or untick them. But what we'd like to get to is a point where if you have the competencies, you would have all of the KSAs below that competency. But this requires some changes to the to the framework, and this is something where we really will have to do um, additional work to um, to make it into a structure that's that fits with that so that's where we're wrapping up this webinar um, but i would like to um thank a number of people um, marta could you advance to the next slide please so there have been a lot of people involved in creating all of this um, but Someone I'd particularly like to thank is Alva, who did the first proof of concept for the Knowledge Resource Center and the EBI web development team. And we actually have a number of people, but Prakash is the main uh, the developer of the competency hub. 
and also the, the New Knowledge Resource Center. Uh, Christopher created the um, avatars for us and the, the framework for to be able to create more. And we've already mentioned um, that the first external profile will be coming in and Celia and uh, Maike um, have been really valuable in creating, giving us feedback on, on how it works and also um, where, what direction we might take the competency hub in, in the future. The competency profile itself has been created by past present members of the Bioxar Consortium, but also the community. We've had additional input from people um, at the EBI. The career profiles, um, for each profiles, multiple people have been involved. And here's a list of, um, of the people that have been part of that. Uh, and that's where we'd um, like to finish the webinar for today. So um, thank you very much. And we're happy to take any questions. Yeah, so my question would be how you deal uh, in case you have uh, two very similar uh, profile, but uh, so to the same function. So for example, software engineer, but uh, the description and uh, the competence are slightly different. Could handle your app this or what you handled, how you think to handle the things. I think that's a really interesting point. And I think um, so one thing that I think we could do, but it'd be really interesting also to know what Marta thinks. Um, we've spoken about this a little bit to some extent. We've spoken about this in two contexts. One being is where actually you can have someone develop over time. So for the moment, we've addressed that by having creating separate profiles for different career stages. But in a similar way, you could also have almost like a subspecialty so you could have um, a research software engineer with a particular focus and then at the second profile it's a research software engineer with another focus um, at the moment the way we would have to implement that is to actually create two separate profiles we'd like to think about whether there is a way to link those profiles together the way we would the same way we would do that for a junior and a software research software engineer but for the moment, that's not possible yet. So for the moment, what we would do is create two separate profiles and make it clear in the title that they have a similar role, but maybe a slightly different focus. So what do you think, Marta? Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think that's that's clearly how we would do now, adding two different profiles. Then, of course, the question is that if they are only different at the level of uh, knowledge, skills and attitudes, it's not going to be visible in the first image of the profile. You would need to click on each of the competencies to see whether they have the specific knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So I would say that if we see the need for those different career profiles or levels to be created, we might want to think about defining the competencies in a different way or listing the KSAs in a different way. Thank you very much for those uh, answers. Uh, the next question we have is from Simon Wong. Uh, Simon asks, who annotates the training courses with the competency frameworks, metadata and uh, KSAs or levels? So for the moment, that's been done by the EBI training team. Um, we've there's been a few people involved, but we've tried where possible to be quite consistent in that. So there have been, um, I think, over the five years, about three or four people that have been involved in doing that. Um, we've thought about at different times whether we should have um, multiple people look at that, but that was really quite difficult from a kind of time intensity uh, point of view. I think what we have found in doing that mapping is for some courses that or for some resources that's easier than for others because it really depends on how much information is given about a particular learning resource so if you have a resource where there is for instance an overview page that's got really nice um, learning outcomes defined and maybe gives you a set of tools that it uses and uh, breaks it down in modules but obviously we have a lot more information to go on than if you really only have a title and you then kind of had to, would have to go through the entire tutorial um, 
or the course to be able to accurately get an impression of what um, what the content is. So we, we've had to take a little bit of a balance there where we have to have, do the mapping at a relatively high level. And this is actually also one of the reasons we'd like to move towards having learning pathways so that we can highlight courses where we are sure of the quality and sure of the content. Thank you very much for that answer. And uh, Simon also says thank you um, in the comments. Uh, with that, I don't think we have any further questions. So I would like to very quickly talk about the upcoming webinars from BioExcel. Um, the next webinar we have is uh, happening on the 8th of December, and it's uh, a discussion about the Gromax CP2K QMMM interface, uh, which should be rather interesting. Essentially, the developers of Gromax have been uh, developing an interface with CP2K for a while in order to make or to allow Gromax to um, perform QMMM better than it currently does. Uh, so I imagine that this one will be a very interesting webinar. And uh, the other thing that I would like to uh, flag up is the uh, BioXL best practices in QMMM simulations, uh, which is um, a uh, uh, from my understanding, a webinar uh, series um, with uh, some very interesting uh, speakers, uh, experts in the field of uh, QMMM modeling, uh, each talking about how uh, the, the, the quirks and tricks to performing good QMMM simulations. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Vera and Marta again for uh, giving the very interesting presentation and to thank all of you for coming to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you.